My name is Professor Bob Snow. I work at the Kenya Medical Research Institute Wellcome Trust Program and I am a malaria epidemiologist. Uh, well, briefly, to, to talk, describe the history of malaria over 100 years <coughs> would require uh, more than five minutes. Um, but in essence, what's happened is that at the turn of the last century, um, about 1900, malaria probably reached its natural extent in Africa, which included all of North Africa, all the offshore islands, quite a long way south in South Africa as well, Southern Africa. And then in the first sort of 50 years, 50, 60 years or so, I mean, fantastic progress was made. I mean, malaria was eliminated for all of North Africa. There was no malaria in uh, Reunion, Mauritius. So control efforts had actually shrunk the map of malaria in Africa down to a, a, a section below the Sahara running all the way across um, and all the way down into South Africa. I mean, South Africa had also made progress. I mean, it shrunk its map of malaria further and further um, east um, to a constrained area around KwaZulu-Natal and Mpalanga. But largely, I mean, there was a huge number of people still living under sort of intense malaria transmission from about 1970 all the way to today, and the map hasn't really shrunk very much since. And in within there, there has been a big reduction in the likelihood of being bitten by a mosquito infected with malaria. So the number of people who have malaria in their blood has also dropped dramatically, but it's gone in waves. So the first wave was when we introduced DDT and chloroquine in the 1940s after the Second World War. There was a big drop then. And it remained quite low for a long time until we had the perfect storm when there was El Nino epidemics in the 90s, uh, increased rainfall, big sort of flooding, and we had emerging resistance to chloroquine. So then we had a massive peak, I mean a huge epidemic across the whole continent. Um, and that's when the world woke up and realised that we had to do something. And then the big efforts made to raise more money, uh, global fund support, roll back malaria initiative, things like that. And we introduced two other magic bullets, insecticide-treated bed nets and artemisinin-based combination therapy. And malaria, you saw, then began to drop. And we're at a stage now where it's much lower. It's the lowest it's ever been for over 100 years. The thing is, it's probably stagnated. So now what we see today is a sort of bubbling along at a lower level, but still there, and still infecting millions of people across Africa. Well, Africa uh, is home to 98% of all the malaria burden worldwide. I mean, over 90% of all the deaths that occur in the entire world occur in Africa. And there's been a lot of talk about um, eliminating malaria from the planet. I mean, several people have said in their lifetimes they don't want to see malaria anymore on the sort of globe. But to be fair, I mean, Africa still has nearly 800 million people living in a sort of a belt across Africa where malaria is part of their daily lives. Half of them, sort of, 400 million people <coughs> live in areas where there's one in four children walking around with malaria in their blood today. Um, and I mean, it is really the cradle of the world's problem is still in Africa. So you can't ignore Africa. Um, Africa has <coughs> other issues, other problems, which allow us to be in a situation where there's still lots of malaria here, including poverty poor governance, conflict, um, lack of economic investment and things, but that's why there needs to be a focus on Africa. Well, I think we're doing everything we can currently with the tools that we have available, but if I had to look to the future, um, we need more tools. Uh, we need One thing that we can learn from the history of malaria is that the malaria parasite and the malaria mosquitoes are incredibly clever and very adaptable, so that we will, and we are seeing resistance emerge to both drugs and insecticides. So we need more effective insecticides, more effective drugs to combat what will happen in the future, which is an emerging resistance 
uh, to both. We, we need vaccines. Um, the vaccines that we currently have and that we're currently trying um, are okay, but they may not go to scale. They may not be good enough to implement um, at a sort of wide population level. So we need continued investment in vaccines. Um, but the, the two things I think that would make a biggest difference, and this is from history outside of Africa, is that economic development actually when you reach a point of all your female going to school, um, there's electricity, there are paved roads, malaria does disappear. And I think that's the one message that we need to fully understand, that the future of malaria in Africa depends largely on how well Africa develops as a continent economically. And allied to that is how well is the health system invested in. So governments across the continent need to invest in a strong health system. I mean, I don't believe that malaria will be eliminated from Africa in my lifetime or anybody else's lifetime, but there should be no deaths from malaria. That is unacceptable because children should be treated quickly, they should get access to emergency care in hospitals when they need it, and no one should die. So if I was to think of a future, and I was to think of a future milestone, it would be that no child, no individual in Africa, dies of malaria. And I think that's achievable. I think for our group here, it's been investing in mapping the risk of malaria in Kenya to begin with, then across Africa and globally. Um, and I think that work has really transformed the way we think about disease, uh, think about investing in interventions. So we work very closely with national governments and the World Health Organization to try and identify areas where you might get the biggest bang for your buck and areas where maybe giving everyone bed nets is a waste of money. So using the cartography, the geography of malaria, to design control, design investment, I think has been one of our biggest achievements and I think that that's a space that will continue to grow. The other area that is largely uh, the work that I'm now funded to do, that I think is obviously important, is the relationship between how often you get bitten by a mosquito carrying parasites and your speed of developing immunity. Because we really don't understand properly still to this day after hundreds, hundred years or so of research, the relationship between infection and disease outcome. So how likely are you to develop severe disease given how often you are bitten by an infected mosquito and how likely you are to die? That is a whole concept and a whole body of research that's been neglected for a very long period of time. And to design what the future of malaria looks like, we need to understand that. So I think that that's uh, an important area as well. Well, as we said, I mean, malaria is still a major killer. Um, you can't neglect malaria um, from a research point of view. There's been a massive increase, even announced this week or last week, in sort of donor assistance to malaria. The UK government, for example, has increased its budget to the Global Fund. It recognises, and the world recognises, how important it is to get on top of malaria. Um, there has been a shift as well, which I'm really grateful to, uh, in making sure that a lot more of that investment goes into Africa for disease prevention and disease control. Now, obviously, as I've said, we need new tools. We need a better understanding of malaria. Um, I cannot imagine why you wouldn't increase the amount of money going into malaria research if you increase the amount of money that's being spent on its control, knowing that that will only last for a short period of time. Since about 2009, um, we've worked very closely with the Kenyan government to try and help it identify areas where you will increase the amount of intervention coverage and areas where you might do things differently. And we've kind of shaped the Kenyan policy uh, in that sense. I mean, beginning with work in 2009 by Dr. Abdeslam Hamid Noor, um, and that was very influential. I think we've extended that beyond Kenya's borders. We work now in Somalia, Sudan, Djibouti, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, 
many other countries where we provide government support for basically epidemiological intelligence. It's trying to understand the landscape of malaria in a country so that they can design their national strategies effectively. They can actually invest in a clever way. And it's, again, using the science of malaria cartography and understanding the epidemiology of the disease to shape that. And that, that's been driven by us here in Kenya. Um, I mean, it's now grown into an, an initiative called the High Burden, High Impact Initiative run by the WHO, but it really actually began here in the programme. 